Okay, I've just been told we're live, so we're live on air. Hi, everybody. This is John Broughton from Danfoss. Um, today, I'm doing a live stream just as a follow-on from two Cauldron webinars that I did earlier this week. Um, we were doing some work in the Call Selector software, and within the Call Selector software, we've got a Cauldron uh, selection tool. So today, we're going to do some uh, live uh, selections uh, within that. Now, during the webinars earlier this week, um, we got people to give us some uh, calculations. So we're going to do three calculations, and uh, I've chosen them just out of random of the uh, the data that was selected. So we're going to go. Uh, we're going to use the uh, call selector software, which hopefully you can uh, see on the screen in a minute. And uh, we're going to yeah basically do it live. So I uh, hope you can join me and yeah, let's have some uh, some fun. Um, please let me know where you're calling in from. Um, you know, if, you've, if you're new to Call Selector, uh, if you've got any questions regarding Call Selector, also generally regarding uh, cold rooms, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions related to cold rooms, the refrigeration systems, uh, installation, all those sort of types of challenges that we face within the industry. So uh, yeah, just let's try and have a, a good interactive discussion so i'd really welcome any comments on the chat any uh, any questions uh thumbs up if you hear me okay all that sort of thing so uh yeah let's go so the first selection that we can do came in um from a guy called gooder and uh yeah it's basically a, a cold room minus 25 degrees c um, eight meters by nine meters by four meters with uh, fresh chicken. Um, that then the chicken's coming in at 15C. So we'll open up the tool now. So hopefully you can see that on the screen. Perfect. Um, so this is the uh, cold room calculation tool that is inside inside the Danfoss Call Selector software. And we'll just open it up. So we uh, we click on the button here and we get uh, basically the first step of the process. Now, we've got a, a wizard function or we've got the manual function. Um, today, I'm gonna use the wizard function. Basically, the wizard function uses, uh, let's say, data within the tool and it auto fills a lot of the uh, parameters to make life easy. If we do it manually, then uh, we have to enter all the uh, data. And just as a, a point to note, if you want to know all the intricacies of the tool, then there is a help button down here. If you open the help button, then that will open a PDF and uh, it explains a lot more. Today is just, uh, you know, try to use it to, as best as we can hands on. So let's go to the wizard. And basically the first step of the wizard is we look at the dimensions and the uh, temperature of the surroundings so the uh, ambient temperature also the humidity humidity is most important um, if we have a very high humidity then that puts an extra load on the cold room because we've got a lot of moisture then if we open the door of the cold room then that moisture uh, sucks onto the uh, evaporators so uh, yeah let's go so this selection we had a, uh, a room of eight meters so we'll just change these uh, parameters we had eight meters by nine meters and it has to be said within call selector this is a uh, a tool for your sort of typical commercial cold room now size wise within this uh, software we can only go 25 meters by 20 meters by four meters high so it's not uh, you know made for your extremely large cold rooms it's more your uh, commercial size mainly because if we go too big then the the Danfoss units that it selects won't actually cover the capacity so that's the uh, the main reason why we sort of uh, limit it to that size uh, so we have eight meters by nine meters by four meters high And we'll take that as uh, inner dimensions. Now, temperature of the surrounding air, um, he says ambient 38. So we've got 38. Don't know what the humidity is, but let's uh, let's make it a little bit uh, interesting. Let's say we've got a humidity 70%. Uh, temperature below, below the floor. Uh, let's take it as, uh, let's say 16 degrees. And yeah, if we go down to minus 25, then we'll have an insulated floor. So we click next. 
Uh, we have a product of chicken. Now you can see here we have goods, so we can scroll up and down and we can choose uh, various products. It is fairly uh, generic. You know, we can choose fish, we can choose dairy, we can choose mixed products, um, you know, meat, vegetables, so on and so forth. It's not uh, that specific where we can choose the type of meat. So it is uh, meat fresh or meat frozen. In this case, this selection is chicken. So uh, let's just uh, scroll up or scroll down and let's find chicken. So we've got poultry products, poultry products, which is fresh. And the heat load was 10,000 kilos. Now, what we'll do with uh, the program itself, that's 10,000. We, and his inlet temperature was 15 degrees. So that's the temperature of the product coming into the cold room. Now, this will estimate the available mass that we can actually store chicken in that room. We can't have 100% of the, 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 the volume of the room full of chicken, otherwise there's no room for the refrigeration equipment. Obviously that's most important. And there is no room for you to walk around or have a pallet truck or a fork truck within the cold room also. So Cool Selector has a, uh, within the wizard, it will calculate the available storage area within that room. And it does that uh, on these percentages. I'll leave it as 45% of the room is used for goods and 20% of those goods are changed each day. Obviously that can, uh, can change and these can all be overwritten. So we'll click OK. Now with those, uh, with those parameters, we can actually only fit in this size of room 7,776 kilos of product. Now, if we change that and we say, okay, well, actually we're gonna use maybe 60% uh, of the room for product, and we click okay again, then we've got uh, you know just over our 10,000. Um, that might mean that there is not a lot of room to move around in the store, um, but you know that that has to be gauged. And one way that I do it, which is very simple, is I look at the uh, physical quantity that we want to store in that room. So we're saying 10,000 kilos of chicken. Um, now, if that is uh, uh, chicken breast or, or chicken meat, then you can do uh, quite an, an easy calculation. A lot of it is available on the internet, and it will tell you what weight per meter cube you can get of chicken. Now, I know roughly it's about 600 kilos uh, in a meter cubed. So you can then do a simple calculation, uh, 10,000 kilos divided by 600, and that will give you the number of pallets in meter cube that you physically need to store in that cold room. And you can do a, a quick uh, layout of the cold room floor, see where the pallet's gonna play, see how many you can store, maybe one high, two high, maybe three high, depending on the height of your cold room. And then you can uh, just do a double check to make sure that you can physically fit that much product in that cold store. So we've, we've altered that a little bit. So uh, we've estimated our mass and we click our next. Now, room conditions, again, these are auto filled in by the, by the wizard, by data that's already in the software. But let's, uh, let's see what they wanted to do. Now, we had a, a room condition of minus 25. Relative humidity operating hours. So let's, we've altered the operating or the uh, room condition. So let's estimate the operating hours. So 85% humidity, operating hours, 17 hours. Then we look at the type of panel. Again, this is automatically done in Cool Selector 100 mil. If your panels are thinner or thicker, then we can alter those parameters to suit. Obviously, thinner panels mean we've got more heat load coming in from the outside through the structure of the cold room. Thicker panels means we have uh, less heat conductivity from outside to inside, so uh, less heat load. So let's leave that uh, as the default values. We hit the select button again, and we have basically an, an overview of our room. We have our length, width, height, which we've inputted before, the room conditions, poultry products. Now, 
we've, we have our quantity per day and our inlet temperature. Our inlet temperature was 15 degrees. So we're taking that chicken from 15 degrees down to minus 25. We have our air exchange information. So the ambient temperature outside, 38 degrees, relative humidity. Uh, we have door openings. Now, if this is a uh, blast freeze, which is basically what it looks like because we're taking chicken at 15 degrees and we're taking it down to minus 25, generally they're going to open the door, load the cold room up, shut the door, and then run the process. So the door openings will be rare. Now, if it was a cold room that is uh, what I call a picking cold room, so product is stored in the room and people are going in and out constantly to, uh, to take a box or a pallet, then you can decide whether the door opening is uh, often or regular or, or rare. Um, so we leave this as rare because of the process that we are doing. We have our uh, panel information. Again, we're leaving this as the default data that's come into Call Selector. And we've got our additional loads, again, calculated by the wizard here. So lights, fans, people. Um, if it is a process, then I'd probably say there's going to be nobody in there during that process. So we'll put the people to zero. It will be uh, electric defrost now. Again, if we are taking it at 15 degree and taking it down to minus 25, that's a process. So there might not be any defrost time during that. Um, again, we need to know that when we uh, when we talk to the customer exactly how he's expecting to use his system and how long his pull down time is going to be. Um, at the moment, we don't know that. So we'll leave the defrost load in there for now. Then we click next, um, and it comes up with a warning. So cold rooms are normally not dimensioned to freeze incoming goods. Uh, you have specified the temperature thing to be above the freezing point. Do you want to continue? So let's click yes. Now, it may be that we don't have a, a unit that will do this duty because of this large uh, temperature range we're going from plus 15 to minus 25. So it's not a, a cold room as such. It is a, 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 a blast free. So it's a process room. Uh, but yeah, this is the joys of doing things live. So let's let's take this one step further. Now, um, I'm going to leave it as, as Europe, even though the conditions are generally not Europe, 38 degrees. Um, and I know this guy is not, uh, is not from uh, Europe, but let's leave it at that for now. So optimal plus. Uh, it's chosen our refrigerant because we are going down to low temperature. Let's click next. And it gives us our cooling capacity. Now you can see there we have 70 kilowatts. Um, now I know that Danfoss does not have a condensing unit for 70 kilowatt capacity. So in this case, um, we can certainly do the sizing of the expansion valve. Um, solenoid valve, etc., but we will not be able to provide a condensed unit for that capacity because the this software is is based on, um, let's say, your your typical commercial cold room. But let's click uh, select anyway, and we'll generate the application within Cool Selector. And I'm uh, interested to see what comes up. We have this not responding; it's just uh, it's just working for a few minutes. And it's still working. It's still thinking about it. It's probably thinking, uh, wow, 70 kilowatts. I don't think I've got a condensed unit that big for 70 kilowatts. Uh, but yeah, let's see what it comes up with. So uh, yep, yeah, and we come with the message, no condensed unit could be found for the selected operating conditions. That's because we have got uh, quite a high heat load of taking that chicken from plus 15 to minus 25. So in this case, that's not functioned. Um, what we can do is we can go back and edit our selections. So we'll run the wizard again. And we'll start the wizard. Now the wizard will remember everything that we've put in there before, the dimension size, uh, temperature, the surroundings, humidity, etc. Let's go to next, uh, poultry products, inlet temperature. Now we'll, I'll leave the inlet temperature. Uh, let's say we are still freezing the product. So the inlet temperature, let's say, is... Uh, Let's say minus 15 and click next, uh, room conditions. Okay, so we selected uh, fresh. 
So we want our room conditions to be, uh, let's say, minus 25. Now, we have a bit of an issue there, so let's just go back one. I'm just going to go to poultry products, and it's poultry products frozen now. So we're bringing in the product at, uh, I said, minus 15. And then go next, room conditions, minus 18, polyethylene panels. Select exactly the same uh, pieces of information. We click next again, click next again, uh, and we get our cooling capacity of 7.4 kilowatts, much more uh, in line with the range of Danfoss condensed units. Click select. And then we will create the application again. There'll be a slight delay um, while, it, uh, while it does its magic. And then we will get the information delivered up. So we'll get the condensed unit information, expansion valve information, pipe sizes, etc. So we've got our condensed unit information up here. We have not got a controller uh, because of the uh, defrost power is too high. And we've got the liquid line information and the suction line information. So if we click our condensed unit uh, picture, we then get the information on the performance of that condensed unit. Uh, things, to, uh, things to always check is we have the performance graph here. What I would always look at is the operating envelope of that compressor. Now you can see here that we have chosen uh, this particular code, a 114X3486, and we can evaporate between minus 40 and minus 10. We're down uh, that sort of range. So we're, you know, minus 26-ish as an evaporating temperature. Um, absolutely fine. It's got room to work. That compressor will lead a, a very long and, and happy life. Uh, and I'm just checking the chat to see if there's any questions, but so far no questions. So I'll keep, uh, I'll keep talking. Uh, can you increase? Okay, so for some reason, I'm not... Uh, ah, okay, the chat's just appeared, so... Hi, Dwayne. Um, and, uh, right, okay, then was good. Da, 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 da. Okay, so, okay, what's the largest condenser in the range or condensing unit? Um, that is a, uh, a very good question. Um, it depends on the uh, range of the units, uh, whether it is the, the slim pack, the plus, or the inverter units. Um, and I, again, it, it depends on the evaporating uh, temperature and uh, condensing temperature. So that that has to be uh, looked at depending on, on the application, to be honest. Um, it's a little, uh, it, it, it needs a little bit more information on that. Uh, and that is from WTL, whoever, whoever WTL is. And uh, it'd be nice to know where you're based. So if you can uh, put that on the chat. Uh, so I've got a message up on the screen. Pull down time is critical. How can size without knowing this? Well, yeah, exactly. Pull down time is critical. Um, and in this installation, you know, we, we, we did this live. So we got these questions. Um, but those are the important things that we're actually missing. So yeah, it's it's not possible. And the reason that I put that up on the screen was to basically show that we don't have all the information, plus we don't have units, uh, you know, that that big on a uh, 70 kilowatt duty. So thanks for that question. So we got uh, ah Sydney. All right, that's uh, that's good. Nice to see you in Sydney. Um, spent some time over there in the last couple of years, uh, going around the various wholesalers. So uh, nice place. Uh, and we've got uh, Warren. Okay, all right, Warren. Thanks for that. Uh, da, 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 da. Just checking the chat. As a man, it's difficult to do two things at once. So. Okay, so let's go back to that. If there's any more questions, please uh, please put them in the chat. If this is making sense, if you can hear me, if I'm talking okay, too loud, too soft, um, too fast, too slow, just give us a thumbs up in the chat so I know what's going on. And 
So that's the, the information on the condensed unit. As you can see, we are within the operating envelope and we've got a bit of room to play with the operation of that condensed unit. Let's say the customer brings in uh, chicken that is uh, slightly warmer, let's say, than it should be. It will raise the suction pressure and that compressor is okay up to sort of minus 10. So it will cope with a slight variation in temperature of the chicken com coming in, but it certainly won't cope with, uh, you know, very high positive temperatures as we saw, because then you've got a very high uh, heat load for the unit. Um, as I said, we don't have a controller because the defrost load is, is too high. We have the information regarding the liquid line and the suction line, uh, solenoid valve, and the expansion valve. Now, things to mention regarding the pipework for liquid line, for example, we have the selection there, so a 12 mil um, liquid line, and our velocity is 1.8 meters. So we are just on the border uh, for me. Uh, one meter per second on a liquid line is, is fine. Don't go much above that because then you can generate a bit of noise on the system, um, but then also don't go too low either. Um, sorry, don't go, don't go too low. As you can see there are 10 mil. Our velocity is up at 1.69 meter a second, which might get a bit noisy. And uh, if we drop down uh, too much, yeah, I'd rather keep the uh, velocity between 0.6 and, and one meter is, is absolutely fine. So that's the, uh, that's the liquid line. Let's just finish the liquid line. Uh, and then we go to the suction line on the evaporator. And if we click there, we can see it's chosen a 35 mil. Now, the velocity there is up at uh, 9.5, which, and again, it, it all depends whether it is a, a vertical line or whether it's a horizontal line. If we're looking at suction lines that are horizontal, you want a suction velocity, you know, four meters a second, six meters a second, something like that. If you've got a suction riser, um, then you'd be looking you know, around about sort of eight to 12 meters a second. Now, the reason we have that velocity, most important is to get the oil back to the compressor. If we get the oil back to the compressor, then, uh, you know, again, the compressor lives a long and uh, happy life. So just bear with me because my screens are misbehaving a little bit. Okay, so we have, uh, we have some more questions that I can see on here now. This is, um, okay, no. I've just been asked if I can increase the size of the window a little bit, but unfortunately I'm sort of at uh, full screen size here. So apologies for that. I hope you can, hope you can see it okay. I know some of the text is, is quite small, so sorry for that. Um, is there any more questions in the, not at the moment, okay. So, so yeah, so that's uh, suction line information. Always think about the velocity. Velocity is important because we want to get oil back to the machine. And, uh, you know, if we don't have oil back to the machine, then we can have a compressor failure, which is uh, never good. Um, I'm just checking questions, but no questions so far. So, so that was one selection. Now, you, you can see there that, you know, this software is, is not designed for that sort of calculation. This software is designed for your sort of, uh, you know, average commercial cold room. Now, what we'll do is we'll uh, go back and we'll do a, another selection. Um, fairly, uh, fairly similar, I guess, but this time somebody's asked a question for enzymes as the, uh, the product to be stored. Um, on the screen. Okay, so we have a question on the on the screen. He says, "What is the recommended defrosting power?" Okay, hi Albert. Um, now that is, if we look at that cold room calculation that we just did. Let's go back and edit the selections again. And I'll basically show you. So we're just gonna run the wizard again. Now, 
as we go through and we get this overview screen, the functionality of the software will give you that recommended uh, defrost power for that evaporator. Now, this is based on application know-how. Um, and as we can see there, the power is, uh, you know, just over 5,000 uh, watts or five kilowatts. Uh, what I would always say whenever doing a selection in, in something like this is once you've done the selection and you've selected your evaporator, just double check the actual size of the defrost heaters in that evaporator, just as a double check to make sure that this figure here, this uh, 5,268 watts or 5.2 kilowatts is there or thereabouts what you've actually got in your evaporator. Um, there are, um, let's say, calculations, and I've got quite a few books around my office with me that give me the approximate defrosting power per size of evaporator at different conditions. So that information is available, um, but it is taken care of within Cool Selector, but just do a double check on that. So I hope that answered the question okay. If it did, just give us a thumbs up on the screen. Um, if not, then we'll uh, try and answer it a different way. Okay, so you know, it's uh, it's like trying to drive two cars at once a little bit, this, but never mind. So I hope that answered the question regarding the uh, defrost power. So let's just go back to this, uh, do a new selection again. Now, this one again was a, a bit of a strange one. Is Somebody asked a question again for a cold room. And they gave me a very uh, you know, strange product to put in the cold room. They said enzymes. Now, with the, the Danfoss Cool Selector software, we can choose certain products. It is a little bit generic. We can't sort of drill down to, to that level, unfortunately. Um, but what we'll try and do is uh, we'll try and do this, uh, this calculation a little bit. So let's look at... Uh, 12 meters by 10 meters by four. And we'll take all these as uh, internal. So four meters, temperature of the surroundings, 38. So obviously not Europe. Be nice if it got up to 38. Uh, humidity, yeah, we'll raise it a little bit. Let's say uh, 60. Temperature before the floor. Now, this is a target temperature of 5 degrees C. Now, again, depending if it is a cold room that is built by a manufacturer, it might have an insulated floor. It might not. Um, generally, small boxes would have an insulated floor because it's just a camlock box. If it's a little bit larger, 12 meters by 10, um, more than likely we'd just have a concrete floor at that temperature. So we'll, uh, we'll tick floor uninsulated there. So we click next, and then we have mixed products. Now, the challenge with something like uh, you know enzymes is it's quite specialist, and we don't have that level of detail within this software, um, unfortunately. So uh, you know the the the, the closest um, we've got to anything like that would be uh, would be meat. Um, whether that is the the same uh, Pacific heat or not. I don't know. We'd have to check that on the internet. Um, again, this shows the limitation of this because it, it is, again, based at your sort of typical commercial cold room. But just to mention it, because uh, I, I think it is quite interesting. I know you can find the Pacific heat of enzymes on the internet because I uh, found it the other day. The challenge is I can't put that into the system, even if we do it in the manual mode. And I'll just go back to the manual mode a second. If we define it manually, um, we still are limited a little bit by the good or the goods choice, the products within the cold room. So again, we can only choose these predefined uh, products. So we'll uh, go back to the wizard again. So that one's, uh, you know, a little bit difficult. We can't. We can't do that. We just don't have the the data for enzymes within the uh, cold room. Now, if we look at another selection, uh, which was Jason. I don't know whether Jason's online. Um, if you are Jason, say hello. 
He's uh, not so far. Okay. So this was a guy called Jason. Now we had, um, this was quite a topical one, I guess, for the, uh, for the time we are in with the uh, pandemic. Uh, so we had 4.5 by three meters. by 2.9 and we had our ambient temperature 21 so it's obviously inside a building okay uh, temperature of the floor floor is insulated um, I know what it is so the floor will generally be insulated uh, humidity 55 so that's fine now Jason came up and said uh, okay what's uh, how do we do a uh, a morgue, so uh, storage for uh, you know for uh, uh, bodies. Now, again, we don't have uh, uh, that in in our list. So you've got two options. You either choose the uh, the closest, which uh, a bit uh, you know is meat, fresh meat, which is there or thereabouts the same. Let's say. Um, personally, I would do a double a double check. Um, quantity per day now he gave us 900 kilos oops not 9000 uh, temperature of inlet would be room temperature so that would be uh, uh, yeah let's say average room temperature could be 21 could be 16 we don't know that's a little bit uh, misguided a little, a little bit like the previous one um, you know, how can we do a pull down or a reduction in temperature for 15 to uh, plus 15 to minus 25 with a chicken when we don't know how long that that process time is? A little bit the same. It says room temperature, so let's assume room temperature is 21, um, even though the average temperature I know in the UK is 16 degrees. Um, but let's take uh, let's take 21, and he would like to store them at uh, plus eight. Humidity 85, so let's do an estimate of the operating hours again. So 16 hours per day, polyurethane 50 mil. Um, do a selection and we get our information. Same thing, all the data that we have inputted before, we've got the length, width, height, room conditions, uh, meet, as I said, that's the closest we can get to at the moment. With the air exchange now door opening, uh, Difficult discussion, whether it's uh, regular, often, or rare, I'd leave it as regular. Panel information. Again, if there are uh, different types of panel, you can do a custom panel information. So you can choose the thickness and the conductivity and the uh, exterior temperature. But let's leave it as standard panels for now. Our additional load, so we've got lights, fans, people. Um, you generally in a more cold room you wouldn't have people going in the store you would be pulling the uh, the bodies out on a tray fan load light load again generally um, that would be uh, a lot less but let's leave it as the calculated 108 watts for now defrost it would be uh, natural defrost so let's click uh, next okay so again, we've raised this question. The temperature of the incoming goods is more than 10 Kelvin above the room temperature. Do we want to proceed? Let's click yes. And let's see if we have a uh, unit available for that. We've got a cooling capacity, so uh, fairly small. We've got our cold room information, so our temperature, humidity, operating hours, the heat load. So we, we're given the transmission through the uh, through the walls through the door, um, ice on the evaporator, the goods, cooling, respiration load, light load, etc., fan load. So we click select again and it creates our application, which uh, takes a couple of seconds or so while the internal cogs of cool selector are wearing away. While that's doing, I'm just going to uh, check the chat. If uh, any chat on the screen, any questions? Everybody's very quiet today. Whether I'm covering everything or not, 
but uh, but yeah, if you've got any any questions, and as I said at the beginning, if there's any questions generally regarding cold rooms, uh, we can answer. It doesn't have to be just about the selection today. If it's about refrigeration general, uh, if it's about the installation operation of the compressor expansion valves, um, you know, we can widen up the topic uh, with pleasure. I've also got uh, various presentations we can use or the whiteboard behind me that we can use so uh, if anybody's got any questions stranger the better uh, we'll do our best to answer them so again cool selector has done its magic and we've now got our selection so we've got our condensed unit selection the controller selection this time and the liquid line solenoid valve uh, expansion valve information exactly the same the the things to as i said if we click the condensed unit things to highlight Obviously, we've got the performance graph. The envelope I've spoken about already, but again, you can see here we have uh, the operating condition of that compressor is right within the envelope, so that, that's nice. It's got a bit of room to maneuver on that. We've got the performance details. If I click on the next tab there, you'll see the performance details. Now, that is a very good, let's say, double check when you're on site commissioning the unit. You can actually see what's happening within that unit, so you can check the condensing temperature, um, suction pressure, suction temperature, discharge temperature, to make sure that it is doing what it should be doing, let's say. Now, we're getting uh, fairly, uh, fairly quiet on the chat, so yeah, please ask as many questions as we can. Um, okay, let's, let's have a look. So we've got a question. Uh, we've got a question from WTL again. Now, that's Sydney and that's Warren, I guess. Um, hi, Warren. So in that application, we need to have a higher humidity. I would suggest a little lower than, say, five degrees. I would actually say the same thing. Um, I wouldn't store a body at 8K. That was what came in on the uh, when, when I did the webinars on Tuesday. He said eight degrees. Um, to me, that's a little bit warm for a body. I would have said five. When I was on the tools, um, I've been on the tools in refrigeration since I was 16. Uh, I'm now much older than 16. I won't tell you how old. Um, but we always stored the bodies at four. So, uh, you know, to keep them uh, nice and cold, they don't generally complain. Um, Humidity-wise, again, very, very good question. And we have to think about the, the TD, the temperature difference on the evaporator. Um, for a, 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 a body, you want a, a nice humidity in there. Not too much, not too little. If it's uh, too little, you tend to dry the, uh, dry the uh, yeah, body out, unfortunately. Uh, if it's too high, then uh, it can get a little bit wet. So we don't want that either. So I would have said about 80% uh, RH, 80% humidity would, would be absolutely fine. Um, yeah, just got to be a little bit careful. They're generally not stored in there for too long. Um, so, yeah, you don't want a low humidity and you don't want a high humidity. So, okay. So I hope that answered the question, um, Warren. If it didn't, uh, give us a thumbs down. If it did, give us a thumbs up. Um, lower delta T, uh, lower, I guess, when you're talking about uh, the delta T on the evaporator. Now, I always refer back to a very, very old book that I've got in front of me, which is uh, going back to Presque Old Days, which is a long time ago now. Um, but basically, and I always refer to this, if you want a humidity something around about, let's say 80 to 85, you'd have between seven and eight delta T on the evaporator. Um, if you want, a, uh, a much higher humidity, let's say 95%, then you'd have, let's say, a 5K delta T on your machine um, or on your evaporator. Agreed. Thanks, Warren. Um, it's something that is important, and you know, it doesn't matter whether you're storing, uh, let's say, bodies or fruit and veg or fresh fish or fresh meat or whatever. Um, humidity in the room is incredibly important because if you don't get the right humidity, then you will spoil your goods. Um, and particularly for, you know, very high uh, quality, very high expensive goods, that is incredibly important. Um, so, uh, yeah, the design TD is, uh, is very, very important. And 
the other thing to me that is important when you're doing this sizing with a condensed unit and the evaporator is to make sure that you get the balance point right because if you don't get the balance point right then your delta t on your coil is out your humidity is out and then you'll have problems with your product so uh yeah most important so i hope that was good um just looking there is another question from okay da, 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 da. For some reason, my questions are not uh, are not going. Okay, there we go. Um, so Babaka has asked a question: What is the typical temperature difference between evaporator and plus and room for both minus and plus zero cold rooms? Um, generally, if it's a frozen room, um, humidity doesn't matter uh, as a sort of general statement. Um, if you are, let's say, uh, you know, for temperatures uh, freezing and below, um, generally a sort of 6K delta T is absolutely fine. And if we're talking about 6K delta T, then we are looking, you know, somewhere between, um, let's just read my book correctly because I always have to check this, uh, 6K. So, yeah, you're looking around about 80%, 85% humidity. Um, there's no point dragging too much moisture out the air because then you're just going to put that on your evaporators and that's going to cost more money to defrost uh, and block up your evaporators quicker. So in a, uh, let's say, negative temperature room, humidity doesn't really count because the product's frozen already and humidity is not going to have a huge effect on the product, but it's going to have an effect on your evaporators. So, uh, so that's that. Then if we're talking above freezing, uh, so positive temperature room, it really depends on your product that you're storing in there. Um, and every product needs a different humidity. So, uh, you know, fruit and vegetables, meat, fish, uh, there's lots of information on the internet. Uh, and I've got lots of in information here in front of me on, on what you need for, for, for a Pacific product. Um, obviously, if you have, uh, and we'll, we'll take meat, for example, if you have a, a very high humidity, then the meat can get a little bit slimy. If you have a very low humidity, then you lose weight from the product because you're pulling moisture out of it, which for your customer is not good because generally he sells, you know, fruit, vegetables, all those sort of commodities by weight. So you don't want to to, uh, to pull moisture out the product and then reduce its weight. Uh, and also, if you remove moisture out the product, then you will reduce the quality of that product. Um, so I hope that answered that question, Babaka. Um, yeah, just give us a thumbs up if it did. Um, there's a question from uh, Francisco. And Francisco says, so let me move that out of the way there. It says, hello, when I'm selecting a liquid line, which parameters do I have to be more concerned, velocity or pressure drop? Um, for me, velocity, because pressure drop in a liquid line is, is not a big concern. Pressure drop in a suction line is a big concern, but velocity, keep your velocity round about one to a second, um, everything will be fine. If it's higher than that, you can have some noise. Um, things to do for liquid lines generally, uh, and well, all pipe work, to be honest. Um, don't use tight radius elbows. Make sure everything is clipped correctly, uh, most important. Um, and on your suction line, incredibly important. Make sure the velocity is correct so you get your oil back to your machine. Um, so many times I go to site and the velocity is or the pipe size is, is is way too big, so the velocity is too low, and we get oil starvation to the machine. So hope that answered that question, Francisco. As I say, give us a, a thumbs up if it uh, if it's okay. So let's uh, da, 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 da. so any more questions? Not at the moment. All right. Um, so coming back to our cool selector screen, we have here. We've looked at the performance. We've looked at the envelope. And we, this is the performance details. And as I said, it is incredibly good, very helpful on site. So you can actually do a double check to make sure your system is operating correctly um, as it should. So, you know, things like suction pressure, um, discharge pressure, uh, discharge temperature, things like that. So very, very good sort of double check. 
Um, information tab here is the all the available spare parts and uh, Eco Design, which is uh, for Europe. Other thing to mention is we have this documents and visuals tab here. So if you click the documents and visuals, then you will get a pop-up with all the documentation for that particular unit. Um, and if you click on any of the links, then that will open up a PDF file that you can, uh, you know, print, download, uh, etc. So uh, that's always worth a mention. Now, the other things you can do with the functionality within Cool Selector is you can generate a report. So if we click the uh, report tab here, it will generate a a uh, nice report in a few seconds when the, the cogs were away. Um, thanks, Francisco. Okay, that's good. Always nice to get feedback that I uh, answer things correctly and uh, it doesn't need any more explanation. So there we have our report. We can give the project a name. We've got our operating conditions and we've got our selection of our condensed unit. We then go down to the cold room controller again just gives the uh, okay i'm just going to break off a second because it's always uh, for me much more fun to answer the questions um wayne you've come back just make sure that the subcooling through is very good with high pressure drop in liquid line to ensure that saturation is not reached and vapor is produced at the entrance of the metering device oh very good comment uh, hang on a second i'm just going to take a drink Yeah, subcooling is important. I mean, generally in a standard condensing unit, you will get a certain amount of subcooling, but not very much. Um, but yeah, need to make sure that your liquid is subcooled. Make sure your condenser is doing its job. Make sure the condenser is nice and clean, making sure it's got uh, vapor bubbles, Wayne. Yes, indeed. Um, it's sometimes I get asked this this question quite a lot regarding sight glasses. Oh, I can see bubbles. Um, okay, maybe it's flashing, maybe it's not, maybe it's a little bit low on charge. The best place to put a sight glass is in front of your expansion valve or your metering device. If it's there, then you can categorically say, yes, I've got a good column of liquid and I'm getting proper uh, expansion. So uh, that's always a, a good thing to, to uh, make sure because um, as we said regarding the velocity, if you've got too high velocity and your pipe is too small and you've got restrictions, then yeah, you can cause flashing, which is never very good for the expansion valve. And generally, if ever people complain about a system's not working, uh, at least to me, the first thing that they complain about is the expansion valve. And my camera's just gone a bit fuzzy, so apologies for that. I'll try and get the thing to refocus again. It's a bit temperamental these days. Uh, if not, I'll have to stay a bit blurred for the time being. It should recover itself, hopefully. Um, but yeah, you need to make sure that you've got a good column of liquid hitting the expansion valve. So uh, I'm glad we all agree on that one. Uh, yeah, all right. So just seeing if there's any more questions. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's come back to that and then I'll go through the sort of top three things regarding cold rooms generally, because um, that's always a good topic and uh, one that I've spoken about quite a bit before. So we get the report, we get all the information, um, lots of information there. I won't bore you to uh, death with all of that. The things that we can do with that report, we can print it, put it in a PDF, etc., etc. And then we also have a bill of materials functionality which basically gives you the code numbers that you need for that specific job, which can be exported again into Excel, Word, PDF, etc., or it can take you to the product store. So uh, that's a bit of blurb about uh, Call Selector and the tool. As I said, it is a uh, generic commercial cold room tool. We don't have every single you know, uh, product that you would store in a cold room. One sort of question that I always like to get an answer to and i'd really welcome some comments on the chat what is the most bizarre or strangest uh product that you've had in a cold room um so uh yeah please put your answers on the chat because uh, i always find that quite interesting my strangest one was electronic components uh in a factory and we said to the guy you know why if you've got these PCB boards in a cold room? 
And he said, well, if we don't store them in the cauldron during the assembly process, they actually uh, uh, fail, let's say. So they had to keep them at a, a very specific temperature all the way through the production process. So that was a bit strange for me. I've never seen um, el electronic components kept in a cold store before. Um, so that, that was a very new one to me. And uh, yeah, if anybody's got any strange things, I'd really welcome it on the uh, on the chat. So top top three things about setting up a cold store. And for me, it all comes back down to the sort of basics. If you get the basics right, then everything else follows through. And the main, main, main one really comes down to the selection of the, the cold room itself, the actual structure of the cold room, the, the fabric of the cold room. You know, I, have you got the right thickness of panels? Uh, the right format of the cold store the other thing to me is where you put your evaporator again incredibly important um you know put it as far away from the door as possible so that we get good air circulation we're not getting moisture on the back of that coil uh you can uh, so you know that doesn't frost up your evaporator quickly um then really it comes down to that heat load calculation get it correct um don't overestimate it, don't underestimate it, try and get it right. So many times I spend a lot of time on site and people will have uh, overestimated the uh, capacity and that's generally done by the person who does the selection. Then somebody will come across and think, okay, maybe I'll just add another 10%. Um, and then somebody else might say, oh, well, I'll, I'll maybe put 5% duty extra just to make sure. Um, and, and that sort of then, you know, makes it uh, uh, over capacity. And yeah, that's uh, A, a waste of energy, and B, it's not gonna work as you intend it to. So that to me uh, is incredibly important. And then the general in installation, you know, make sure, as I said, the evaporator's in the right place, make sure that your velocity is right, make sure you, your oil return is right, make sure you've got good airflow across your evaporator, good airflow across your condenser, and the system is, you know, set up and, and I use word commissioned, um, you know, don't just uh, turn it on, um, you know, make, make sure it is commissioned and you check suction temperature, discharge pressure, uh, suction superheat, set up the expansion valve, all of those things, very, very important. Um, so we've got another question there from, uh, uh, we've got a question from uh, Hosin, I think that is the, uh, hopefully that's the correct pronunciation. Let me just, uh, minimize something a second so would you please talk about the effects of liquid line size and length on compressor failure um yeah compressor failure is one of my most favorite topics uh, again spend a lot of time on site with uh, with issues such as that now i'm just going to lean forward a little bit and see if my camera will refocus that's better because it does get a bit fuzzy every now and again um the effect of a liquid line and the effect of a suction line. Now, the liquid line is there to transport liquid refrigerant to our expansion device. Um, most important, as we said, if it's too small, you will get uh, noise and you won't get enough uh, liquid to the expansion device. If it's too large, then we'll get low velocity. Um, so we can, uh, you know, then we'll have a very increase charge in, in refrigerant we then try and pump the system down that refrigerant's got nowhere to go so the liquid line size is important but i would say the single biggest uh, issue that i have on site is suction line size and that's getting the correct velocity back to the compressor and if you don't have the correct velocity then you won't get the oil entrained uh, in that refrigerant coming back to your machine and the compressor will run dry of oil and eventually um, you know fail um, and the other topic regarding pipe lines generally or pipe runs generally is you know three meters five meters ten meters um, you know yes we, we can live with that um, I've seen jobs where we've got sort of 70 meters, eight meters, 100 meters of pipework. Um, that is an incredibly long length of pipework. You have to ensure absolutely perfectly that you get your velocity correct because otherwise you're going to struggle to get your oil back. Uh, you've got to make sure that you do your uh, pipework correctly. You know, if you're leaving your evaporator, make sure you do your U-bends and goose traps so that we actually entrain the oil back to that compressor. 
Um, so pipework generally is is a huge issue for me and a challenging one when you go to site because um, you'll see AC installations, you know, with 100 meters of pipework plus, uh, and then people come onto the commercial refrigeration side and do exactly the same thing and then wonder why the compressor fails. So, uh, you know, that, that really is important to me. So I hope that sort of answers that uh, uh, correctly, Hussein. Um Yeah, if it does, give us a give us a thumbs up. Um, okay. Yeah, as I uh, question that I asked, as John asked on the live stream, what's the strangest thing a client stored in the cold room? I'd be really interested in any sort of comments on that because it does fascinate me as to what people keep in uh, cold rooms. Um, so yeah. Any any answers I'd really welcome on the chat. Um, so we, we're sort of done with call selector. I can't really take that uh, any further. Um, hopefully that was useful. Um, if there's any more questions on the uh, on the chat, you know, generally regarding cold rooms, uh, installation, compressor failure, expansion valves, uh, anything like that, then uh, you know, let's try and have a, a good discussion. Um, if not, we're sort of coming to the end. Let me uh, just double check down here a second. Uh, okay. Now, the I've just got a another question uh, coming up regarding sort of uh, typical problems that we get on cold rooms. And um, let's say let's come back to the sort of basic principles again you know regarding the uh, the sizing the selection the installation and so forth um somebody asked the question in uh, one of the meetings on tuesday um where do we put the evaporators um and as i said previously five minutes ago go you know try and keep them away from the it's always a, a, a big challenge because if the door is open constantly we get moisture coming in through that door and it goes straight onto the back of the cooler um, and you know we have issues with uh, airflow across the evaporator we have problems with the expansion of the liquid and you know general operating uh, issues with that cold room um, if you've got one cooler, then that, that's fairly easy. Put it away from the door as, as far as possible. If you've got two, two evaporators, three evaporators, four evaporators in a cold room, where do we place them? Um, and again, a question from the, uh, from the chat, really. Um, and if you can put your, your answers or your questions on the chat, um, what is the rules of thumb that, that you use as to where you place your evaporators? Uh, one person last week uh, got very cross with me and he said the main priority should be the drain point. Uh, that's where I locate my evaporator. Um, and, and that to me is, is totally wrong. The main thing is, uh, you know, from a, an airflow and a point of view of that evaporator, the drain to me is, is totally secondary. Um, Okay, so question from uh, uh, Anders: Bullets and cannon shells. Jesus, that's a that's a strange one. Um, yeah, I guess they've got to be uh, kept stable because, as we all know, with explosives they become unstable at certain temperatures. So, uh, and that was from Iron uh, uh, Star. So, whereabouts was? What was that uh, stored? Um, yeah, if you can give me some uh, more information on that, that would be interesting. Um, and and Vicor Miller asks, what is a diff what is about what is about the height difference between the condensing unit and the evaporator? Condensing unit below the evap or condensing unit above the evap? Surely this should also be considered. Um, yeah, and that question's just been put on the screen. So. Yeah, it, it's it's height difference is a huge issue. Obviously, again, we've got to maintain that correct velocity both in the liquid line and the suction line. Again, coming back to this this point that I always sort of labour is if we get the velocity right in the suction line, then we will get oil back to our machine. Um, if we've got a vertical riser, so we are, uh, you know. Uh, if the pipes are, are going vertical, if it's coming, if the evaporator is above the condensed unit and the suction line is coming back, then the oil is going to flow. 
if the condensing unit is above the evaporator, then we need oil traps in that suction line riser. Uh, and there's there's various rules of thumb as to, you know, is it every two meters, is it every, every four meters? Um, some people put them, uh, if you're going through a, a building, let's say generally people hide them within the, uh, the, the fabric of the building. So they're about every sort of four meters. Um, keep your velocity right. And, you know, think about it logically. We've got to get oil, oil back to that machine. So that is the, the most important. So we've got to keep that velocity right. Um, you know, if you were to say to me, I've got 100 meters between the condensing unit, uh, which is on top of a building and the evaporator, which is on the basement, um, I would say no. That to me is common sense. Um, to others, maybe not so. But uh, yeah, it is important. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges in today's sort of built environment is where we can put the condensing unit compared to where the cold room is. Um, noise is a constant issue these days. Um, where do we site that that unit? Um, you know, can it go on the uh, on the street? Can it go on the pavement? Can it go on the roof? Can it go on the side of the building? Um, always challenges with that. Again, we have to have this balance between what is practical as in where do we put the unit and will it function um always a difficult discussion because you know when you are uh, getting involved with the local governments and, uh, and and things and they'll tell you exactly where that unit can go and where it can't go then you have to have a balance between what is practical uh, and what is feasible so uh, yeah hope that answers that question uh, victor um and Warren has said, I have a video on why compressors fail. Yeah, that's uh, hopefully a, a good one. And that's maybe a sort of topic for, for further discussions uh, on, on why compressors fail. Um, we can discuss that a little bit. Just let me uh, check my other, my other chat down here. We've had a, uh, another question from Anna, from, uh, from Peter. Uh, and I think we'll have that on the screen in a second. So let's just minimize that again. Uh, what about the impact of glide present on blend refrigerants on the components? Um, generally, I try not get too uh, confused about, about glide. Uh, yes, we have glide on refrigerants. And if we're talking about expansion valves, uh, operation of the commas, that is taken into account when we do the selections. Um, I think the biggest challenge regarding, uh, you know, refrigerant blends is the different pressures and the different temperatures. And do we do we do it at uh, uh, dew or bubble? Um, but yeah, I mean, when when we do a selection, particularly in cool selector, all that is taken care of with regard to the glide. So uh, uh, hope that answers that question, Peter. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Let, let me know if you need more on that, Peter, and we can come back and maybe take a, a sort of deeper discussion. Um, all right, let's have a look, see if there's anything else on the chat. Okay, a question from, um, and I hope that is the correct pronunciation, Modesto. Uh, what about CO2 installations? Design, the design conditions change. Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, if we're talking a traditional HFC system, um, you know, we, we, we're talking pressures uh, on the high side, you know, 25, 30 bar, somewhere around there. If we're talking CO2 installations, if we're subcritical, uh, then we're, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 bar. If we're transcritical, we can be up at 80, 90, 100 bar. So the pressures change, certainly. Uh, design conditions change. <sighs> In, in essence, if, if we're talking about, let's say, a CO2 condensing unit and a CO2 evaporator, then the magic happens within the condensing unit. That's fine, whether it works subcritical or, or transcritical depends on the ambient temperature. Um, pipe work obviously has to make sure, or, or all the components in the system, we have to ensure that we have the right maximum working pressure for, for the conditions. Um, ambient temperature is obviously important whether we work in subcritical, transcritical. Um, regarding, you know, that, that just has to be taken into account from the design uh, phase, if you like. 
but the you know velocity and all of that is still as important uh, about getting oil back to the machine particularly um, from practical experience let's say co2 compressors generally uh, they transmit a lot of oil out of the system so you need a good oil separator in there to uh, to stop that oil coming or to keep that oil within the system so I hope that sort of answers that one as uh, as we can um, uh, Warren just coming back to your question you've got a video on on why compressors fail um, yeah that that's a, a say a, a very good topic of mine and we can we can always take that discussion on here also or we can use that as a, a sort of further topic um, you know for a, a live chat or whatever um, there's a question up from uh, Francisco and that is uh, a YouTube question uh, and he says what happens if we select a line far from recommended velocity values well that comes back to what we discussed previously really if we talk about liquid line if we are uh, let's say high velocity then we'll get noise in the system uh, and you'll hear that as a whistling noise um, you can also get uh, pipe movement on a liquid line you can also get pipe movement on a suction line um, if it's uh, if the if the liquid line is is too big uh, we have a low velocity now biggest challenge with that is that we then have a much greater refrigerant charge much greater cost to the uh, customer because we've got you know too much refrigerant in there if we have a line that is too small the velocity will be incredibly high and we might not be able to provide that expansion valve with the right quantity of liquid to expand to actually do the refrigeration effect that we want to uh, to do from a suction line point of view um, again coming back to what I what I uh, say if we get the the wrong velocity too low velocity we won't get oil back to the machine um, if we have too high velocity we'll have a suction penalty and uh, you know the compressor will need to be uh, much larger or slightly larger than it needs to be because of that uh, suction line pressure drop uh, so hope that answers that question Francisco and Warren comes back um, so he says uh, if the condenser unit is above the condenser you use an inverted loop at the outlet of the evaporator that rises above the evaporator correct uh, so the liquid does not drain into the compressor during off cycle the old inverted loop yeah i sort of call them swan necks and goosenecks um, and uh, there's lots of information on that we do have a, a lot of material on the danfoss infographics which you can uh, search for that if you just do a google search for danfoss infographics uh, or the friends behind the uh, the screens might even put a link up for that um, but yeah this sort of comes back to what i say to a lot of people is you know get back to first principles proper pipe work proper pipe work design proper velocities proper pipe work size uh, and proper you know goosenecks one necks uh, to make sure that you look after the system because at the end of the day that compressor is the heart of the system and if that heart stops beating then the system stops uh, a bit like our heart to be honest um, so we did have another question on the chat which was uh, question okay so we did the the co2 one and i believe these questions are from um linkedin so uh apologies for not mentioning that before because we've got two feeds we're up we're live on linkedin and on youtube so we're sort of um bouncing between the two question wise so we've got a question from uh katingula um hope that's a pretty uh, accurate uh pronunciation so best position to put your sight glasses where now i'll annoy everybody who makes condensing units including danfoss um, best position to put your sight glasses in front of the expansion valve because the expansion valve is where we want a full column of liquid that's just in front of yeah in front of the expansion valve uh, so that's the best place to actually check the, the quality of liquid and the quantity of liquid that we've got um, so yeah best place is there i know on everybody who makes condensed units including danfoss um, we put the sight glass in the condensed unit um, and that tells you that you've got liquid coming out of your uh, unit but then we don't know what happens between there and the evaporator so is the pipe work uh, you know the right size too small too big blah 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 so 
uh, always best to put it in front of the TV, particularly on rack and pack systems. Um, you know, let's say uh, one of my most favorite things is in a supermarket uh, on every run to every line of cases, I'd put a sight glass so that we can at least make sure that we've got good quality liquid there. So I hope that answers that uh, question. And I got a thumbs up from uh, Francisco. So thank you very much for that one. Um, so uh, Am Amha, is that right? How to calculate cold room to use it zero degree and minus 20 degree. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's, um, we have to be careful. And this all comes back down to the operating envelope. Now, if I can uh, go back to my system, let's go back to the, uh, just bear with me a second. So if I go back to my selections again, and uh, we'll just swap over to the cool selector screen. So let's just go back to the operating envelope again. Now, obviously, if we're talking at zero, the heat load will be a lot less than it is at, than it is at minus 20. So we, in theory, and uh, th this has to be sort of very uh, practical based, um, if you want to evaporate at, at minus 20, then you would have to, uh, you know, choose your uh, system whether you, and if you want minus 20, then you'd have to have the system be able to evaporate down as minus, minus 20. And your compressor envelope would be able to, or would have to cope with those two extremities. Now, you can see here with this particular compressor, it's a 134A compressor. So it's minimum evaporating temperature is minus 15. Now, if we go to cold room one, which I think was uh, 452. Now, here, that is minus 40 to minus 10. So in theory, this compressor would be okay. If we if we want minus 20 in the room, we'd be evaporating maybe minus 28, somewhere around there, so we'd be okay. And if we wanted zero in the room, yeah, minus ten is just on its limit. Uh, I mean, really, minus eight would be would be preferred, um, but that's just on the the absolute crusk of of that compressor. So you've got to be very careful because down here, that compressor is quite happy. Up here, you are right on the edge of the envelope, so you would have to look after your machine. Um, it's not ideal, let's say, but it can be done. The problem is you would have to decide what is your priority. Is it minus 20 or is it zero? Um, the system would have to be designed for minus 20 because that's the lowest temperature and your cooler would have to be designed for minus 20. And then up at this sort of temperature, everything would be, your selections would be out, let's say. It's not ideal, um, but it can be done. The main thing you have to manage and look after is your compressor and make sure it stays within its operating envelope. If it doesn't, you will uh, kill it quite quickly. And particularly when we're up at high evaporating temperatures like this, then the best thing to do will be to fit crankcase pressure regulation on it so that we keep it within its envelope. Because if we take it outside of its envelope up here, um, we'll kill it very, very quickly. So uh, yeah, those are the things to very basic to sort of think about. Hope that answers that uh, okay. Um, let's see that we've got some more questions on the chat. Um, so a question from Hosin, how can we protect from compressive failure because of oil loss? Have Danfoss compressors internal temperature protection for this reason? Um, good question. We make, uh, let's say, hermetic compressors, so hermetic scroll compressors, hermetic piston machines, and we don't have an oil pump uh, on those machines. We do have, uh, or you can buy, let's say, um, uh, optical oil sensors that will physically measure the, the oil in the compressor. Danfoss has a, an oil sensor. Um, so you can 
physically monitor the level of oil in the compressor via a third party device like an optical sensor um, that will you know stop the machine if it if it uh, senses a, a loss of oil um, the other way to do it obviously is to uh, put an oil a separator on the system so that we entrain and we catch that oil that goes out in the discharge line and we then feed that back to the machine via a float uh, so we can do it that way um, the best way we can protect the compressor is to ensure that we have the right suction velocity and this comes back to the discussions that we've had before regarding the pipe work if we get the right velocity we will get that oil back to the machine um, if we keep the machine operating within its envelope then we will uh, let's say reduce the amount of oil that is carried over by the action of the compressor out the discharge line if we operate at the extremities of the envelope um, particularly in low pressure scenarios and very high pressure scenarios, we can um, that will cause more oil carryover, and by that I mean the oil will it will be entrained in the refrigerant by the action of the compressor, and that will be pumped out. So, uh, and it has to be said, the other thing is commissioning, and I come back to this phrase commissioning quite a lot. You know, when you start a a new installation. Yes, commission it, run it up, make sure it's working. Then maybe five days time, come back, check the oil level. Is the oil level okay? Um, if it's not, top up the oil level. Come back a little bit later, how's the oil level? Just keep a check on it for you know the first few weeks of that installation to make sure that it's not carrying over too much oil. Um, so yeah, hope that answers that question, Hosin, in a, a fairly um, simple way. Um, and we've got uh, Warren coming in here. Bear in mind that most meat products have freezing temperatures less than zero degrees C. That means if you place the product in at zero, it will have a latent load. Uh, yeah, beef is freezing 2.8. Uh, pork is freezing minus 1.7. Yeah, correct. So uh, it, it you you have to design the cold room for the product that you are you know storing it in in that room. Um, don't assume just because water freezes at zero that everything else freezes at zero also. Um, yes, a lot of products, whether it's vegetable or uh, organic, you know, the, the majority of that product is made up of water. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, so that's a very good point, Warren. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's this is a generic cold room program. And, you know, we've got... Uh, chicken we've got uh, uh, beef we've got, got vegetables but it doesn't go into the the sort of detail of is it a potato is it a leek is it a onion you know whatever it, it's just a generic potato because it's a very generic piece of software if you are storing you know thousands of tons of a product then it's much better to do a dedicated uh, selection for that and um, Warren, you say makes a huge difference to capacity. That's our friends on uh, YouTube. Yeah, it does make a huge difference to the capacity um, because you've got your uh, latent um, heat as well. Um, all right, let's, uh, another question uh, on LinkedIn um, from Daniel. What refrigerants do you prefer for your units freezer and cold room with low GWP? Yeah, that's a very topical question, um, Daniel. Um, <laughs> um, we as a world are being uh, driven to low GWP refrigerants, which I'm not saying is a bad thing. That's, uh, you know, we have to protect the planet most definitely. Um, so everything is going down the low GWP route, which is good. Um, if you think about, you know, history wise, um, you know, we all started off with ammonia, CO2, sulfur dioxide, things like that in the late 1800, early 1900. Then we had the CFCs and now we sort of come full circle. Um, you know, now we've got the uh, HFCs and now we, you know, going back to natural CO2, ammonia and the low GWP. And the low GWP, the lower GWP we want in the refrigerant, we've got two routes. We've got the naturals, so CO2 ammonia, um, and the hydrocarbon, um, or the flammables, let's say. So, uh, And then we've also got things like A2L refrigerants, which are mildly flammable. Now, at the moment, the 
world uh, generally you know we're moving to a low GWP at the moment we're on 448 449 452 for, for very low temperature uh, 134a still has a, a job in the medium temperature um, but generally 448 449 452 and then as we are pushed down to the GWP 150 and below then we really don't have a choice it's either going to be CO2 ammonia or it's going to be the A2Ls and the flammables, so the mildly flammable and flammable. Um, and yeah, let, let's see where that goes. So uh, yeah, that that's the situation at the moment, I guess, Daniel. Um, all right, so that's that question. Let me just we have another we have a question from uh, Amjad. I have a cold room of minus twenty six degrees. The evaporator is defrosted through electrical heating even though after every precaution to protect heaters, they still fail after every seven, eight months. Any advice? Um, that's a good one. I mean, the function of a, a defrost heater, as we know, is to uh, you know melt the, uh, the frost, the ice that's built up in the evaporator. Um, I would ask a question where they're actually failing. Are they, uh, are they blowing? Uh, is it a dead short or is it just the heater stops working? And what uh, what I try to do is to, uh, when we have a defrost cycle, uh, one of the biggest challenges is the location of the defrost heaters, location of the defrost termination stat, um, uh, the drip down time and the fan delay on the evaporator. Um, it depends if they're on a defrost termination start or whether they're on just timed only. So you can have, uh, uh, you know, temperature terminated with time and security or just time terminated. I don't know. Depends how long they are running for. Um, you know, you should need to run a defrost for maximum 20 minutes on a, uh, on a, a, a deep freeze. If it's any other than that, maybe look at the, uh, how much frost is being accumulated on the coolers, maybe airflow across the uh, coolers. Sorry, I always say coolers, the evaporators. Um, make sure that we're not boxing in that that cooler with, with product. Make sure it's not above a doorway, things like that. Um, make sure that the electrical terminations are correct. Make sure they're watertight. Make sure that the heaters are not creeping uh, along the coil block and they are tight. Uh, and tied in with uh, with wire, and by that I mean um, if you don't clip your uh, defrost heaters firmly within your uh, evaporator, with the constant uh, heating, cooling, heating, cooling, that uh, defrost heater can sort of creep along the uh, coil block of the evaporator, and then it can put a strain on the electrical connection and and cause a failure. So. That those are the things that I would look at. Obviously, voltage regulation, make sure you're putting the right voltage onto the heaters, things like that. Um, Warren said, uh, he's just put a comment on uh, from YouTube, expansion and contraction, water infiltration. Yeah, how are they installed in, in the evaporator? Um, all those sort of topics. I mean, I can uh, we can actually swap over uh, if I can uh, find some interest in, uh, I'll just share my, screen a minute um if uh, my colleague can just put that and i'm just going to open up a, a powerpoint with some pictures so uh, let's see how how this functions um i think i've got them in here when uh, powerpoint decides to uh, play ball it's uh, wearing away with its brain inside there doing something and hopefully in a few seconds, we'll have some uh, something on the screen. Now it's processing. I always like that when a computer says, I'm processing. So uh, let me just, I won't go through the whole presentation, but I'll see what I've got in here. Uh, da, da, da. No, it's not in there. So where have I put that? Uh, okay. No, I thought I had it in there, but uh, obviously not. So apologies for that. I thought they were in that presentation. Um, yeah, no, these are just uh, nice pictures, but no, it's not in there. So apologies for that. I'm, I can't think where I've put those. Um, so 
let's uh, go back to call selector. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you know the the defrost heaters are in the right place. The temperature terminated. Um, Warren's also said up there. Thank you, Warren, our friend on YouTube. Galvanic corrosion with dissimilar metals. Um, Yep, that's a very good point. The galvanic corrosion exists because you have two dissimilar metals and water is an accelerant of that. So you've got aluminium fins on your coil and you've got a, a metal uh, defrost heater. So you can get galvanic corrosion. Um, what I've also seen on uh, coolers is uh, ice nuts. So you'll get uh, a buildup of ice if you don't clear your coil correctly with the defrost this little nut of ice that you have in your uh, evaporator let's say like this will build and build and build and build and build and it will then either crush your pipes within your uh, evaporator or it will if it forms near a defrost heater it'll actually bend that defrost heater and form a failure as well so it, it all comes down to the, the location of the the defrost heaters are they tight within the coil um, you know, are the electrical connections correct? Are we getting the right voltage? Are they staying on for too long? All of those things. So uh, lo lots to look at, really. I uh, hope that's okay. Um, if it is, give us a thumbs up. Um, check this. Okay, so we've got, uh, right, we've got uh, lots more questions. Uh, so we've answered that one. Um, uh, a question from Isaac Heating. Um, that's just coming up on the chat there. I'll just uh, minimize that. As a service tech, how can I calculate velocity in the field? Um, I guess the uh, the simplest way, and uh, it depends whether you've got a PC when you're out in the field, but within Cool Selector, we do have a, a pipe work section that you can uh, that you can put in the the length of pipe, the duty, the evaporating temperature, things like that, and it will give you an approximate pipe size um, that you need on that piece of kit. So uh, that would be the way that I mean, I drag my my computer around with me ev everywhere I go, um, and and that's what I generally use. So that would be the way that I would do it. Um, a lot of it comes down to you know common sense. Um, I've been in the industry. Uh, yeah, as I said, many, many years. So uh, you sort of get used to, uh, is that the right size? You know, three eighths, five eighths, uh, three quarters, seven eighths, inch and eighth. You, you get a general feel for, is that right or is that wrong? Um, but really the only way, if you, if you don't have that, let's say experience is to uh, use a, a tool. And we have that functionality within the Danfoss Call Selector software just on uh, pipe size. So, um, and I can, uh, yeah, we can, uh, uh, let's look at, uh, let's look at that briefly. So if we can just swap to the call selector screen again, um, we'll see it here. We've got the option for, for piping. So we click the, uh, the piping tab and we click on our diagram to decide where we are. So are we suction line, are we discharge line, liquid line? Let's go uh, suction line, choose our refrigerant. Um, I don't know, let's go for uh, 449A, for example. And then you can basically, and you can get this quite uh, detailed. So you can decide whether it's uh, stainless steel pipe, copper pipe, um, what the uh, maximum working pressure is, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just go with a uh, copper pipe, look at our cooling capacity, uh, evaporating temperature, condensing temperature, blah, 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 blah. And it will basically give you, and you can see here it's highlighted a 15 mil and it's giving you a velocity. Now, uh, I like selection software, but I don't like selection software because it's only as good as the person who uh, uses it. Now, the velocity here is 3.5 meters a second. For a suction line, I think that's a little bit low. I'd rather be up at sort of six meters a second to get the oil back. Um, we have this sort of rule of thumb that anywhere between sort of four and six on a, a, on a horizontal line it is absolutely fine. Um, me, I'd probably go to uh, the uh, the 12, so we get the velocity up a bit. 
get more oil back to the machine. So it's a very sort of quick and easy way to do it. And you can decide, you know, whether it is uh, vertical, horizontal and all those sort of things. But I won't go into it in, in too much depth, but there is that functionality within Cool Selector. Uh, okay, so that's that. Let's go back to, uh, to my beautiful face again. Um, we've got some more questions on the chat. Da -da -da. We, okay, cross uh, in field. Um, right, question from Modesto. What about CO2 insulations design? I think we've answered that one already. Hopefully, um, did we answer that one? I think I think we answered that one from from somebody else. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as we said, it all comes down to the maximum working pressure on a CO2 system. Um, that is the, the, the main thing that we've got to think about is the, the different in the, uh, the maximum working pressure and whether we're transcritical, subcritical. Um, okay, so let's have a look on YouTube again. Um, when we, on that conversation we had about the defrost heaters, MJAD has come back, they are shorted most often also due to I think the heater material is corroding so mostly in the pan heater um, under the evaporator yeah that will do it so yeah I mean the the, the pan heater is the uh, the heater in the, uh, the the drain pan basically uh, and yeah that that is as Warren says that's the most common place to go um, because they are they are constantly uh, in a very you know, nasty environment with uh, water and salts and everything that comes off the moisture. And it also depends, Amjad, what is in the cold room. Um, I guess that uh, sounds a daft question, but sometimes you can have uh, you can have quite an aggressive atmosphere within a cold room, depending what you're storing. Um, you know, if there's any acids, alkalines that are being picked up by the uh, airflow. So that's another thing to look at. Um, uh, Babaka asks, in case of formation of dust layer on the condenser, how does the compressor understand to increase the discharge pressure in practice? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, basically, if we are, uh, if the condenser is uh, blocked or is or is getting blocked, the discharge pressure will increase naturally because we're not condensing enough. Um, is the simplest answer really. Um, so, and, and a, a dust layer on the condenser or a dirty condenser, block condenser, is you know one of the biggest uh, challenges with compressor operation generally. And my webcam's gone fuzzy again, so apologies for that. Let's lean in and see if we can clear it. Otherwise, it looks like you're looking at me through a, a hazy window, but I don't think it's behaving itself today. Um, so, the system will increase the uh, discharge pressure but more importantly it will also increase the discharge temperature and that's what we don't want to do with a compressor if we have high discharge temperature then we uh, then the compressor has to work much harder we have a bigger temperature lift on that compressor puts a lot of strain on the uh, mechanicals of the compressor if we get very high discharge temperatures we then have uh, you know challenges with the oil the lubrication qualities of the oil as well so clean condenser you know incredibly important um, okay so I hope that was okay um, let's come down to the other chat uh, okay so uh, Deepak asks a question, during the high ambient and high humidity conditions and a lot of door openings, there will be challenges in maintaining temperature in walk-in cooler and freezer. How to address this issue, how to manage defrost during these conditions? Um, simplest way is shut the door. Um, but unfortunately, I know and, and, and you know that's not a reality. Um, a lot of cold room operators will keep the door open for excessively long periods of time. Um, there's a few things you can do. I mean, if it is just a, a, a walk-in box, then, you know, we have those challenges. We just have to maintain a very good defrost scenario. We have to maintain that on every defrost, it's actually cleaning that uh, uh, frost off the cooler. Um, 
again, we've got to keep an eye on the uh, temperature. Um, you can also link it so that when the door is open, the refrigeration system is off, so we don't absorb all that moisture on the back of the coil. Again, not very good if that uh, door is open, you know, seven hours a day. You need that refrigeration system to work. So then you've got to look at uh, things on your door. So if they're going to keep the door open, then maybe we need a door curtain on the door. So a PVC strip curtain, for example to uh, try and stop that uh, exchange of air between outside and inside. We can also have a uh, air blower across the front of the door so we maintain a, uh, a curtain of blown air between the inside and outside so that, again, we minimise that uh, uh, you know, warm mid-air going up inside the cold room and uh, getting on the um, cooler. So, uh, yeah, that's that's that one, I guess. Um, you've got to look after the uh, defrost conditions. That is most important. Um, make sure that after every defrost, the coil is actually clear. Um, make sure we've got a nice long uh, drip down time so that we end the defrost. We then have at least five minutes to drip that moisture off the coil. And then if we need to, we can have a snap freeze. So we run the refrigeration system, but we don't run the fans for maybe 30 seconds, a minute, depending on the length of suction line. Um, so we get a good defrost control. So yeah, that, that's in sort of simple terms. Um, biggest thing is just have good door management. Not easy, I know. Um, and if they can't have good door management, then use some form of air curtain on the uh, on, on the yeah, the door itself. Um, and Warren, just as a, a comment, good door seals. Yeah, exactly. Um, that That's another issue with cold room doors. They get a lot of wear and tear. And, you know, the constantly being open and closed, the, the rubber seal on that door um, wears, degrades itself. And, uh, you know, many times you'll go to a cold room and the door seal is either non-existent or there's not much of it. So we're getting moisture going into that cold room all the time, which does two things. It uh, has a challenge with temperature because we're running the refrigeration system more and we're also getting that moist air on the back of the cooler. So, uh, you know, door maintenance and door operation is incredibly important. Um, so that was that one. Um, just... Another question uh, from Deepak. What is demand defrost? When is it needed? Um, good question, Deepak. Um, you can have on a, uh, an, uh, let's say, a Danfoss evaporator controller, Danfoss case controller, there is a functionality called defrost on demand. So that controller will look at the, that evaporator. It'll look at the uh, air on temperature, air off temperature, the amount of refrigerant that's going through, the length of defrost times, etc., and it will calculate, does it need to do a defrost this time or can it skip this defrost? And if it is set up correctly, uh, then it, it works very well, but it has to be set up and it has to be commissioned. And it's it's a, a very good way to you know, save energy because that, that defrost uh, heat that you put into that room has to be removed by the refrigeration system. So that's one energy saving, but then you're also saving the electrical energy of using that defrost heater as well. So, uh, you know, that that is a, a good function. Um, then we've got a question from uh, Modak again on uh, LinkedIn. Hi, John. Just one condensed unit can be used for multiple evaporators in low temp systems? Um, yes and no. If all those evaporators are in the same room and they're all on the same thermostat, absolutely fine, not a problem at all. Um, if they're on separate thermostats, then you need some form of capacity control on that uh, condensing unit to uh, either speed up, slow down that compressor or unload the cylinders so that we have that capacity match between the condensing unit and the evaporators that are running. Uh, so, yeah, it can be done, but, uh, you know, you've got to look at the capacity control or how you are uh, operating those uh, evaporators. Um, just a question from on YouTube again from uh, Amjad. He's recently installed a new ICAD 600 and ICM, uh, calibrated well. After running for one month, there is constant level fluctuation. 
in the separator? Is there any problem in sync of both? Um, I'll be honest, Anjad, it's not my sort of speciality area. I know about industrial refrigeration, but I would have a chat with your local Danfoss sales office and they will uh, get one of the industrial guys to have a talk with you to make sure that uh, you know everything is operating as it as it should. So uh, yeah, sorry for that, but yeah, just speak to your local Danfoss sales office and I'm sure they will uh, help you for sure. Um, and a question from uh, a friend of mine. I think this is a friend of mine, if that's you, Ian Giles. Um, if it is, just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whatever. Um, any idea when we will when we'll go below 150 GWP in Europe? I mean, basically, that's about 2030. So uh, we've got about 10 years to go um, when uh, we will be, uh, you know, we'll be asked to go to that sort of level of, of GWP, which, as I said, will either be the uh, CO2, uh, ammonia, uh, and the uh, hydrocarbons and the A2L, so the... Uh, a3 refrigerants and the A2L, so the flammable and the mildly flammable uh, refrigerants. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Ian. And if it is, Mr. Ian Jones, uh, Ian Giles, just gives a thumbs up, mate. Um, okay, so I've got a question from Warren again. He's just put a screw compressors question mark. Um, what do you mean by that, Warren? Are you are, are you replying to uh, Amjad regarding his uh, iCADs? So uh, yeah, just let us know. That's fine. Um, another question from LinkedIn from uh, Hosin: What is the best met method for selecting electrical protection? Is that the compressor working point? Compressor working point, current or power input? Um, you are trying to protect your compressor. So, uh, you know, that's basically what you've got to base your uh, electrical protection on is the, uh, the the maximum continuous current of that machine. Um, base it on, on that for sure. Um, yeah, I can't really say much else than that. Um, it is important, make sure that your overloads are set, uh, you know, not right on the button, but uh, close enough to actually give you some protection if that machine starts to pull, uh, you know, higher amperage. And particularly important for cold rooms, you know, we do have uh, customers who uh, use and abuse the cold room so that they will put more product in them. They said they will. The product will come in at a higher temperature than they said it will. If they put, uh, let's say, a warm product in a cold room, then that compressor might not be able to cope with that. So the suction pressure goes up, the amps go up, and uh, you know you will get to the point where you are pulling more currents than your compressor uh, can cope with, and you want to make sure that you trip out on overload. Uh, if you don't, then uh, you'll run the risk of, you know, damaging the electrical uh, wiring within your, your motor, with inside your uh, compressor. Because, you know, generally, if you've got a low temperature compressor, the motor is smaller. Uh, if you've got a, a high back pressure compressor, the motor is larger to cope with that increase in suction pressure and the required torque in the motor to actually run. So I uh, hope that answers that one, Hosin. Uh, um Warren says current must be no higher than full amps, correct? Um, if it is, you will, you know, cause some issues with your machine, as we said. So the overload must not exceed the rating on the motor, correct? Um, and yeah, that that is, you know, and, and this then comes back down to the basics again. Always look after your machine because that's what we want to uh, maintain. Uh, if we use and abuse it, um, you know, then we're just asking for problems. Uh, okay, so let's have a look on the other questions again. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so a question from uh, Manish. Um, why isentropic expansion is not preferred in uh, VCRS? Not sure why I, how I understand your question, Manish. Um, just try and ask it in a more simpler way. Um, and, and hopefully I'll understand that. So, uh, yeah, sorry for that. But, uh, yeah, if you can ask it a little bit different way, then uh, I think maybe what you're saying, why is isentropic expansion not preferred in vapor compressors? 
I think that's maybe what you're saying. Um, I mean, nothing is uh, in 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 any compressor. You've always got uh, uh, gaps, so it, it's not uh, it's not a complete compression because we've always got that uh, you know space for when we're compressing the refrigerant. I think that's what you're asking. Um, if it's not, please come back to us again. Um, Warren's put another comment on the chat, otherwise the operating temperature will rapidly increase. Yeah, very much so. And if the operating temperature rapidly increases, then your windings will get hot and you can have a uh, electrical motor failure. Um, yes, we have a clickson in the compressor um, that's buried in the windings and the clickson is there as a safety device. It's not there as an operating device. Um, a lot of the discussions I get is, uh, it's fine, it'll trip out on Clixon. Well, the Clixon's there as a safety. It's not meant to cycle on and off the Clixon. If you do that, then you will damage the windings in the compressor and your compressor will fail. Uh, so, Warren said, therefore, therefore, on the sizing kind of care. Yeah, correct, very true. Um, you're getting a little bit theoretical for me now, unfortunately, because I'm more the uh, practical, pragmatic uh, type of person. So I'll, I'll let you two carry on with that conversation. Um, but, you know, as, as I said originally, we can't be uh, fully isentropic because we don't compress everything. There has to be an egg up there in our compressor uh, and you've got the tolerances and everything else. So, uh, yeah, you you will never get a hundred percent compression. It's impossible, uh, at least in uh, you know practice. Let's say. Uh, so I hope that answers that one. But uh, it's always a good discussion. Um, any more questions in uh, LinkedIn or YouTube? Don't think I've got any at the moment. Okay, in a second, I'm being told. So maybe we'll have some more, see what comes up. Um, while we're just sort of uh, chatting and waiting for any more questions, um, yeah, just, just thinking about the sort of uh, live streams that we do, is there any other uh, topics that you think would be uh, useful? Um, then, you know, drop us a comment on the chat because we're always looking for other topics then w that uh, we can discuss that are, are useful and are, you know, interesting. So uh, if you can think of anything, then please drop it on the chat and we can, uh, you know, put those in for another time. I've got a lot of uh, a lot of material that uh, we can go through on, on many, many things. Again, from a sort of practical, pragmatic point of view, um, I'm, I'm not the greatest uh, theory guy in the world, I'll be honest. Um, I tend to look at things, you know, uh, practically. So uh, and Warren's just come back. Nothing is truly adiabatic. He's, uh, yeah, sort of uh, very true. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Modesto answers, what about CO2 insulations, the design conditions change? Um, I think we've sort of answered that before, maybe from uh, other people also on, on CO2. Um, if we talk a CO2 condenser unit, CO2 evaporator, then the, the biggest challenge is the operating conditions, uh, you know, the pressures. Um, because the, the pressure in a CO2 system is considerably higher than a, a traditional refrigeration system. Um, you know, we can be up 80 bar, 100 bar, 120 bar, depending on the ambient temperature uh, and 30 bar, 40 bar suction. So it's all about the design and the installation and making sure that we have the uh, correct maximum working pressure of components within the system. Um, so, yeah, I hope that one. Um, uh, Surabha asks, can you talk about selection of different types of expansion valves for vapor compression ammonia systems? I was confused which type to go for, PMFE, PM, PM, PLFE, or simply float. Um, not really my bag of tricks, I'll be honest. Um, I'm more the uh, commercial guy. I understand the industrial refrigeration totally. Um, but when it comes down to the controls and, and, and what to go for, uh, then, yeah, that, that's not really my expertise. So I'd have to pass that on to your 
your local Danfoss uh, sales office and they can uh, help you with that on, on, on what to go for. Um, I guess you're talking about flooded systems. So you're talking the liquid level. Um, I mean, if you're talking DX, then, uh, or DX ammonia, which is uh, uh, I've done a little bit of uh, DX ammonia, but a long, long, long time ago. So yeah, please have a chat with your local Danfoss sales office. They'll put you in touch with the industrial refrigeration section of that, and uh, hopefully they can help you a bit with that. So sorry that I can't take that further. Apologies. Um, uh, okay, Warren says uh, electronic metering devices and commissioning. Um, that's a, a, a good topic, Warren. Um, again, you know, comes back to first principles. Anything, uh, okay, okay, I meant for another session. All right, no, that's fine. Um, okay, I'll sort of answer it very quickly for the, uh, for, for the group. If you have an electronic expansion valve on a system, it comes down to first principles. Make sure that the temperature and pressure inputs for that are correct. Uh, and measuring correctly, and then your control will be okay. Um, also, depending on the type of expansion valve you've got, whether it's a stepper valve, whether it's a pulse valve, um, again, different applications need different types of valves. So, uh, yeah, we can talk about that, and that that's quite a good topic, to be honest. Um, very topic for blast freeze, blast chill, actually, electronic expansion valves versus uh, mechanical expansion valves. So, uh, yeah, maybe we keep that for another session. Um, Francisco asks from YouTube, how important is it to select the correct fin spacing and evaporator? Um, it's very important because uh, basically if you, the, the, the colder you go and also the more moisture that you have in your room, the wider fin spacing that you need. Otherwise, as the frost builds up, that frost build will block the airflow across the evaporator and it will not function. Your expansion valve will shut down and you won't get the correct refrigeration effect. So depends on the evaporating temperature. The lower the evaporating temperature, the less fins per inch and the higher the evaporating temperature, the more fins per inch that we have. So uh, yeah, again, very important. If you speak to your local evaporator manufacturer, they will give you guidance on, on what is the correct fin spacing uh, to have. Uh, I've got some data somewhere in a uh, other presentation, but yeah, that, that's a sort of quick and uh, uh, direct answer, I think, Francisco. Uh, let's have a look at the chat from LinkedIn. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, Salman says, hi, John, share the knowledge about CSA store. Um, yeah, just expand on that because like uh, H2O, CO2, nitrogen. Um, okay, um, I'm a little bit, uh, I don't really understand the question, Salman, to be honest. Um, if we're talking, uh, are you talking cold store um, for CO2? Or are you talking about the cold storage of those products? Um, just let me know on, on the chat and I'll try and answer it a little bit further. Um, Warren has just said on uh, the chat, uh, he's never used electronic expansion valves. So uh, things like that would be useful. And yeah, it's an interesting topic, uh, Warren, to be honest. Um, it's uh, as I said, you know, you you get the right inputs, then everything's fine. Um, if you don't get the right inputs, I've been to sites where they've crossed sensors over and all sorts, so uh, you know things don't work as they should. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll cover that in another another uh, topic. Um, yeah, and as I still don't really understand the uh, the, the question, so maybe you can expand on that. Um, uh, I think for now, we're going to wrap up time-wise. If there's any more questions, um, then we'll take them quickly. If not, uh, you know, as I said, if you have topics for further uh, subjects, put them on the chat. We've got the one from Warren regarding electronic expansion valves, and we'll certainly take that into uh, consideration. Um, that would be a good one, to be honest. Um, so he said, ha-ha, well done. Um, all right, we'll, we'll try and do that one. Um, so if there isn't any more questions, then thank you very much for today. Thanks for the uh, the audience, all the conversation. Hope the uh, information we shared on Cool Selector was 
useful. And uh, yeah, hope to see you again uh, fairly soon. So yeah, thanks very much, guys. See you soon.